Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlin. Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. I'm Tim Erlin, Vice President of Product Management and Strategy at Tripwire. And today I am joined by Jen Burns, who is the lead, uh, a lead cybersecurity engineer at MITRE and the cloud lead for the MITRE attack framework. And before we get started with sort of the, the primary topic we had today, can you just just give us sort of a, a brief reminder of what the attack framework is and, and why MITRE created it? Yeah, absolutely. So at its core, attack is a knowledge base of adversary behavior. It's a framework that brings together the different things that adversaries do, whether it's before they've compromised the network, how they get in, or what they do after they've gotten in. Uh, one of the most important things about attack is that it's based on real world or what we call in the wild observation of adversaries. So it's not theoretical and it doesn't cover like everything that an adversary could do. It covers what adversaries are doing or have done in the real world. It's also open source and globally accessible. And a lot of its content is community driven and contributed from people like researchers, uh, intel analysts and other folks outside of MITRE. I think uh, many people probably recognize attack because of the attack matrix, which has the, the tactics or the goals of the adversary across the top, and then the individual techniques um, within the columns. So to kind of get into a bit of history of why it was created, uh, and to be fair, this is all hearsay for me since I wasn't at MITRE when this happened. Um, so no, we like hearsay. It's fun. <laughs> oh, good. Perfect. I have lots of hearsay. Um, so Attack was originally developed based on this need to categorize adversary behavior within a research environment at MITRE that was called FMX. Uh, FMX was kind of like a living lab. <clears throat> it allowed MITRE researchers to emulate adversaries in a heavily monitored environment and perform uh, things like threat hunting exercises. Really, it was for those MITRE researchers to be able to answer uh, the question, how well are we doing at detecting adversary behavior? And they found that categorizing that behavior across relevant, like real world adversary groups was useful. And attack in its initial form ended up being created and used by both the adversary emulation team and the defender team um, within FMX. So that team realized this would be useful for the entire security community. So the first attack model was publicly released in 2015. And from what, what we've seen, you know, in the in the community, the vendor community and our customer community, it, it was well received and has continued to be used pretty widely. So I think I think I'd I'd consider attack a success. Yeah, I think we would uh, as well. It's kind of interesting. Um, one of the the main things that we point at is our Twitter account. Like how many, uh, you know, security groups like this have a Twitter account with that many followers. I I'm not sure what we're up to right now, but we, we have quite a few. I think it's because we really like memes. So <laughs> memes always help. All right. Well, we had a purpose not just to to uh, you know talk about attack generally. There there was a different podcast that we did with um, Travis Smith from Tripwire about the attack framework overall and how it's useful. But the point of this podcast with you, Jen, is to talk about uh, an update to the framework that's just been released. So, uh, how long ago was that update released, and and what are the what's the major change that's included in it? Yeah, so the release was on July 8th, which I think is a couple weeks ago now. And we released officially attack with sub techniques. So, um, you know, going back to the Twitter thing, if you're on Twitter, you can check out our announcement. It's the one with, uh, I think it's a gif of a corgi on a sub sandwich, uh, which, you know, probably has its own story that I won't go into. But uh, sub techniques in a nutshell are basically more specific techniques. So, Techniques and attack represent more of a broad action an adversary may take to achieve a tactical goal, something like process injection, while a sub-technique is a, a more specific adversary action. So I guess to kind of stick with the process injection example, the technique process injection now has, uh, I believe, 11 sub-techniques that cover the different variations of how adversaries have injected code into processes, uh, like via process hollowing or using uh, DLL injection. 
We've had a lot of folks ask why we didn't call uh, sub techniques procedures. Um, you'll you'll notice that I think our uh, attack lead Blake at the time uh, has mentioned this many times in blogs. But the simple answer there is that we already had procedures in attack, and those are those examples of in the while usage of. Uh, particular techniques that you can see on the individual technique software and group pages. So techniques and sub-techniques have their own separate set of map procedures. They aren't procedures themselves. So let me let me first thank you for pronouncing uh, GIF correctly. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, and secondly, I want to drill into that a little bit and make sure I understand it. So you've got techniques, you've got sub-techniques, and you've got procedures. And the relationship between them is, uh, is it hierarchical in the sense that you know, you've got a technique which may have sub techniques. Do all techniques have sub techniques? First of all, they don't. Some okay, techniques so. don't. And then procedures could be attached to either a sub technique or a technique. Is yep. that right? That's exactly right. And and tell me again what the difference between a technique and a procedure is. It sounded to me like you said the procedure is, uh, like what's actually happened in the wild for for taking advantage of that technique or sub technique. Is that right? Yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty accurate. Um, so basically, it's an example of that technique being used in the wild. Uh, so, yeah, okay. yeah, so if you look on like a technique page and attack, you'll see there's this examples table, and it'll show where a, a particular group or a um, software um, has used that technique. Yeah, so you might have a, a sub technique that's been used by there are multiple instances of it in the wild used by different groups or different attackers. Those would be the procedures that you'd find, but the sub technique is the same. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And uh, when we mapped, you know, existing procedures that were already mapped to a particular technique, when we mapped those to sub techniques, we basically took that sub technique into consideration and said, does this procedure apply to this particular sub technique or like the parent? techniques is it more general than that and that's how we ended up mapping procedures to sub techniques so and i i'm i'm i i intend to put you on the spot i will apologize <laughs> for it um so you gave an example of process injection which has sub techniques yes is there an example of a technique that that didn't end up with sub techniques that just stands by itself still yeah let me actually see if i can get you a good one um something like i only want bad examples actually. oh oh gosh all right <laughs> uh, so I'm a cloud person, so uh, something... Oh, cloud in, examples are good. They're always topical. Right? So something in the the cloud realm that didn't get sub-techniques is transfer data to a cloud account. Because that's, at least uh, from the intel that we have, that's a very general but yet somehow specific technique. There's nothing within that that we have that would uh, require a sub-technique being broken out. So that's an example of of that would be used like as data exfiltration. Is that is exactly. that what we're talking about there? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. okay. Interesting. Interesting. And then the process injection. What were some of the the sub techniques that got included there? That's a good question. So we have uh, DLL injection is one. Um, proc memory, process hollowing, process doppelganging, things that were you know you carry them out in a more specific way. So they yeah. ended up getting a sub technique. Yeah, yeah. And so in the prior version of the framework, there was just one technique for process injection. Yep. And then were those procedures or were they just kind of missing? So I think that, so this is not exactly in right, right in my area of expertise, but um, I think what happened here is usually things like that would would have originally gotten wrapped into the description. So oh, if you I go see. through yeah. the procedures, you can kind of see examples of, of these particular now sub-techniques being carried out. But we also had in the descriptions, like some amount of description of how it would be carried out in, right, in different yeah. ways. Yeah. So it was more work for whoever's using the framework to sort of, uh, you know, pick out the what are now sub-techniques to understand fully what that technique entailed. Yeah, exactly. That makes sense. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following 
the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. Now, back to your host, Tim Erlen. So now that, that this change has taken place and, you know, sub-techniques are, are out there, how, how are they specifically useful to the users in the community? Like, what does that change in terms of, of someone who's using the attack framework? Yeah, so folks that were already using attack, um, unfortunately, they might have to go some through some like, a, I guess we would call it like remapping purgatory um, to remap to sub-techniques. But based on feedback we've already gotten, um, we believe sub-techniques are going to be a positive change for the community for a few reasons. One is that we fixed a lot of the abstraction issues that were the initial problem that people pointed out with attack. So it makes it easier to convey things like uh, the complexity of techniques for something like a coverage assessment. So uh, say, for example, you have a detection for a technique like hijack execution flow. You can tie that detection to a particular variation of that technique using one of its sub-techniques like, uh, you know, maybe DLL search order hijacking. So that still leaves a good number of sub-techniques within hijacking execution flow that don't have detection coverage. And now you can kind of process that coverage better. Um, this really, we think it helps get folks away from the mindset of, cool, I have a single detection for a technique, so that technique is covered. I can turn it green in the attack navigator or my spreadsheet and be done with it. Um, and I actually had the opportunity at a previous position before coming uh, back to MITRE to use attack. And this is definitely a pitfall that I had to, to work to sidestep myself. So just being able to kind of generate a more granular score, so to speak, um, based on these individual sub-techniques, I think is going to make a huge difference. Yeah, that seems like it's really important, actually, because if you're if you're trying to use attack to assess, you know, what kind of coverage you have, if you've got a, a binary, you know, green red choice at a, a level of abstraction that that isn't uh, detailed enough, you're going to either false positive or false negative on your on your your level of coverage. Exactly. Yeah. And that has that has material impact, right? Yeah, definitely. And to kind of give you, you know, what, why did sub techniques happen? Um, I can tell you, you know, the first time it kind of hit home for me that maybe sub techniques were a good idea. It was very related to this. Um, it was at Attack Con in 2018. It was our very first Attack Con. And I believe it was, um, Kyle Rainey from Red Canary. He was talking about, uh, five ways to screw up your security program with Attack, which was a great, uh, title <laughs> to begin with. And he got to one of these pitfalls, which was, um, misunderstanding coverage. And the idea was that you, you know, you say you have something like, hey, I have an analytic for this technique, like I'd mentioned, let's color it green on the matrix and move on. It's covered, you know, nothing, nothing to do here. Uh, and then he showed this amazing slide, which I believe had the technique PowerShell colored green in the attack navigator. And he did this, uh, awesome PowerPoint build where it basically zoomed into that technique and the screen like suddenly exploded with a picture of the entire universe. Um, and, you know, I don't know if I'm really doing justice talking about it, but that wasn't the first or last time we heard even at attack con uh, over those couple days that techniques at different abstraction levels is an issue. Like PowerShell is, is way too broad to be a standalone technique and, and show any amount of coverage correctly for that. Yeah, that's a great illustration. It sounds like it was a, a you know a dramatic moment. It was very dramatic. Oh, there were a lot awesome. of oohs and ahs and and claps and fun stuff. So yeah, so I mean that it just it seems like sub techniques make a ton of sense and that the benefit is really there uh, for anybody who's using the framework to assess coverage. Um, you know, the shift or the requirement to adopt this change is is well worth it. Yeah, we we think so, and we're hearing from the community that it's definitely a step in the right direction. Well, that's good. One of the things I really like about the work that MITRE does and the the open source aspect of it and the community driven aspect of it is that you can take on changes like this in a in a more straightforward way than than vendors often can, um, and you can accept community input in a in a very open way as well. I think it makes a, a you know a real has a real benefit for for tools like Attack. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it you know to kind of make an example of that our new cloud matrix that we came out with i think in october of last year was almost 100 percent contributed from the community so it's just so important that we have have that ability to take in that feedback well let's talk about that cloud matrix for for a minute because i'm i assume that as the cloud lead you you were significantly involved in that 
Well, you would think so, but I actually didn't uh, get back to MITRE until about oh. February of this year. So <laughs> a lot of that work, it, it predated me. Exactly. I actually used the the matrix myself in my previous job. So that that was the majority of my like input with it to start. Yeah. Well, I was going to I was going to ask you what else is new with attack because uh, you know, this update isn't the only update that's occurred. Um I you know, there are other changes that occur. So uh you mentioned the cloud matrix. Yep. Um, how how is that cloud matrix valuable? How did you find it valuable when you were actually using it as a practitioner? Yeah, so I think a lot of things happen in the cloud space that, you know, are so specific to cloud that it wasn't really possible to cover it with the current enterprise matrix. And I think there are also, you know, often separate teams that deal with, um, you know, things that are happening on the endpoint, like the things that like traditional enterprise attack would cover, and then things in the cloud space. So I think that that was really uh, beneficial for me. I was a, you know, working as a uh, infrastructure security engineer. So being able to see, hey, what's actually going on in the cloud? Um, what are adversaries really doing instead of, you know, here are all just the best practices for cloud, basically. It was kind of like a, almost like a choose your own adventure of here are all the things that could happen now, you know, see if you can cover everything. But to have this uh, matrix now and attack that's cloud-based and know that it's rooted in real world adversary behavior. I think that's, that's really important. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Absolutely. A anything else that's new with attack that, that we should, we should mention or talk about? Yeah. So there's a couple things that are, that have happened in the past and then I'll, I'll tell you about a few updates that are kind of up and coming. Um, so one of the more recent things is we, <clears throat> excuse me, we released, uh, results from round two of our attack evaluations and those can be found on, uh, attack evals .org. so that in that evaluation we emulated apt 29 and this was a really big effort from the attack team as a lot of the folks that work on attack proper are also involved with attack evaluations and uh, if you're not familiar with attack evaluations it's basically where we evaluate cybersecurity products using an open methodology that we developed uh, that's based on attack and then we make the results publicly available uh, and then we also uh, announced round three for evaluations where we'll be emulating carbonac and fin7 um, kind of future updates that are on on deck, so to speak. One is the merger of pre-attack into attack. Uh, this was announced by uh, our lead, Adam, I believe at the EU attack conference. And if you're not familiar with pre-attack, um, it was originally derived from the first two stages of the seven-stage cyber attack lifecycle, which are recon and weaponize. So we decided to scope it down into techniques that are... Um, three things, technical, visible to some defenders, and have evidence of adversary use. So in a future attack update, we'll be uh, releasing the results of that merger. And that's most likely going to be the addition of two tactics to the attack matrix. Um, and those would be reconnaissance and uh, resource development. Another thing going on is we're working on revamping our data sources in attack uh, with an kind of an initial release of source definitions for that slated to go live to GitHub. And we're also hoping to release technique coverage for network devices, such as routers. Hmm. That's a lot. That's There's a lot. A lot. On the plate. <laughs> yeah, we stay busy. <laughs> so these are, these sound, I mean, there are these more structural updates to the framework, um, but there also have to be updates to just the, the procedures and the, you know, the evidence from, from, uh, from the wild, so to speak. How, how do those updates occur? Yeah, so a lot of it is through uh, open source reporting, uh, Intel reports. We have a team that basically analyzes uh, new reports to add new content into attack. Uh, it's a little different on the cloud side. We don't really have any uh, much open source Intel on that. So that's a lot of just talking to folks who have visibility in that area and, uh, you know, learning what's actually going on to add new techniques and things of that nature. Interesting. All right. So, I mean, we mentioned it a couple of times. We mentioned the, the community involvement, which is really core to attack and, you know, a lot of the stuff that MITRE does. If someone wanted to get involved with attack, how would they do so? What are some of the, the options? Yeah, so one way to get involved is just to um, submit contributions to attack. We have a contribute page on our website that outlines how to make a contribution and explains what we're looking for. Uh, basically, we're looking for examples of in the wild behavior of adversaries. Right now, we're particularly interested in new uh, Mac, Linux, cloud, and ICS techniques. Uh, those are areas where it's a lot more difficult to find 
publicly available threat intel like I was kind of mentioning before. So um, we know we do have some gaps there that folks with that visibility could help us fill. Uh, we're also just constantly looking for any feedback you might have. Uh, we want to make sure that attack is, you know, fitting the community's needs. So um, folks can feel free to reach out to us at any point at attackatmiter.org with things like the way you're using attack, areas where you could see improvements made, uh, anything of that nature. We're also looking for your success stories on how you use attack uh, other than it helping us feel good about ourselves uh, and what we're doing. It's pretty important to get that information out there so other folks can, you know, see how they may be able to successfully apply attack. If you're, you know, just getting started with attack, we also have some resources there on our website. Awesome. Um, it sounds like there are lots of ways to get involved. I, do you find that that it's difficult for uh, practitioners to share you know, real world evidence of, of attack, uh, activity, yeah. you know, based on their organization to are people restricted from doing that? Yeah. I think that in a lot of cases, folks are, um, you know, we try to make it as easy as possible for folks to make contributions to attack. So say, you know, a particular APT is doing something within your environment, um, with a customer, like in a customer's environment, we wouldn't necessarily need the information, about the customer, like we wouldn't want that information. Uh, we would just want to know, hey, this particular technique is being carried out. So we tried to break down those barriers to an extent, but I think that um, in some cases, it's there's just no, you know, getting around it based on, um, you know, what your company has in place. Um, we're also, you know, sometimes we'll be willing to do things like sign NDAs, pretty much anything that, um, you know, we can do to make sharing easier. We're, we're pretty willing to do. Yeah. So there are some options there. I mean, from a, you know, for any organization, obviously you get more out of attack, the more you share into it. Um, and it's that, that sharing of, of Intel that, that, that really drives the, the evidence-based approach. Yeah, absolutely. To totally agree with that. That makes sense. All right. Well, Jen, I want to thank you for spending some time with us. Um, it was a really interesting conversation, and uh, I think there's a lot going on with Attack. This update to, to sub-techniques is useful. Um, so hopefully um, everyone felt that that was uh, uh, educational and interesting. So thank you, Jen. Yeah, thank you. And thanks, everyone, for spending a little time with us and listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Uh, please feel free to join us for the next episode as well. Thank you. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast.